independence, love, social convention, gender roles, and religion. Charlotte Bronte's most famous novel challenges ideas on all these topics, and we are here to discuss it. I'm Charlene. And I'm Mike. And this is Jane Eyre Files. Chapter 29 History of the Wanderer. Hello, husband. Hello, write down decent little critter. <laughs> You had a lot of options or, for... There's a lot of people describing Jane in this chapter. Yeah, chapter. or should I say, right down, that's a little critter. <laughs> I don't know what Hannah's I mean, accent is of, supposed to be. I don't know if you should have done that, but I guess we'll let that pass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, in case you're interested, my other choices were Pallid Wanderer and <laughs> Poor Little Soul. Oh, well. But I do like right down, decent little critter. That's a fun one. <laughs> that's what you thought when you first saw me, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> we have got... A, uh, I know there's a word we use a lot on this podcast, which is interesting, mm -hmm. but this is an interesting chapter. I don't want to say dull. Dull is not fair, a fair word to use. <laughs> Just not a lot happening. Everything seems to take place in one room or one house, maybe mm -hmm. a room or two in the house. Not a lot of time has passed. It's a lot of just observation and learning some of the characters that we're just now meeting in this third act of the book basically yeah i was wondering if this is kind of the first time that you kind of feel like things have just slowed down and maybe yeah. it's it's a little bit boring we've hit a well i think i was gonna say we've hit a snail's pace but i think maybe part of it is is just there's such a dramatic heft mm -hmm. to the her to the end of her the time at thornfield and right. her departure where it's like maybe you do kind of just need that slower yeah. down pace Seems of life. Seems like Jane probably needs that too. Yeah, yeah. And so we as the reader, like, and I mean this in the nicest possible way, I could see this being a chapter that some people, if they picked up the book and they're not, not like totally sold on it, like if someone said, oh, you gotta read this book and they go, oh, oh okay, sure. And they skip to this, this chapter? Is where, no, 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 no. This is where I could see them putting it down for oh, a little sure. bit. And then like they could read the first 28 chapters in a, you know, in a week or two and then stopping and being like yeah, oh she left yeah. thornfield and that like and then you kind of revisit and then you hope they pick it back up again yeah i feel that you know when i was reading this as a teenager this was definitely a part where i was just like oh i i was missing some of that romantic tension and now I'm just like okay these new people that i don't really care about because i want to get back to <laughs> mr rochester where's but... adele where's mrs fairfax <laughs> where's grace Poole? yeah right but i i feel like i've de developed a lot more appreciation for this part of the part of the book mm -hmm. and these characters especially mary and diana especially for how they they treat jane and how she feels with them which oh, yeah. you know we're just we're just going to explore that as we get into these final chapters of the novel maybe i'll have a fonder appreciation for this if after if we discuss it on a podcast <laughs> that's the plan all right let's do the spark note summary for chapter 29 after she is taken in by the river siblings Jane spends three days recuperating in bed. On the fourth day, she feels well again and follows the smell of baking bread into the kitchen, where she finds Hannah. Jane criticizes Hannah for judging her unfairly when she asks for help, and Hannah apologizes. Hannah tells the story of Mr. Rivers, the sibling's father, who lost most of the family fortune in a bad business deal. In turn, Diana and Mary were forced to work as governesses. They are only at Marsh End or Moore House, now because their father died three weeks ago. Jane then relates some of her own story and admits that Jane Elliot is not her real name. Sinjin promises to find her a job. Mm -hmm. Very matter-of-fact summary. Yeah. I mean, I feel like they kind of gloss over the river's backstory. They, that seemed mm -hmm. like it was a really heavy part of this chapter. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. Spark Notes goes into detail on the, on the most minor things, mm -hmm. but then they chose not to, oh, bad business deal, and then they move on. <laughs> like, there's a little bit more to it, I think, right? Or no? Well, maybe. Maybe, <laughs> maybe Spark Notes is also bored with this chapter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're like, when do we, when, when do we go back to Thornfield? <laughs> when are we going to see... You know, we just we just met Bertha, and then now we're leaving. Yeah. Right? Okay. <laughs> anyway, we don't. We're, okay, we promise we're going to focus. We're going to respect the Rivers Clan here, mm -hmm. and and talk and, about and them. Let's get to know them. Yeah, yeah, rather than the rather than the Rochesters and the Fairfaxes and the Fairfax Rochesters. 
Well, so the first introduction we really get to them is through Jane as she is lying in a stupor for three days recovering. And she's just kind of relating these impressions she's getting of people as they come into the room and she can hear them talking about her. And it's kind of interesting that that's the way that we're introduced to them. Yeah, because I think the previous chapter, it's just like she sees them through the window and then and she makes these assumptions about them. yeah and then when she finally does get to come in it's like she's just in like she's not when say crazed but she's just not in a good frame of mind no, yeah she, and and she can't really understand what's going on i guess she doesn't really speak right yeah but i also feel like she's pretty lucid like she she yeah. knows what's happening and she can remember especially that these people are coming into her room and she even like understands who they were who mm. was who was saying who were saying these things so that's just you know maybe outwardly she's obviously exhausted she's dehydrated and mm. um but she, my, her mind mentally she's still there because you know she is our uh truthful narrator we always have to rely on her word mm-hmm. and i think that you know she's she's always been sort of very trustworthy and we know that what she says is probably what's happening yeah and i feel like because she wasn't talking and she was resting and recuperating, she's had time to just sit back and observe, right? Yeah. And, we, and then and that, that allows Charlotte an opportunity to kind of describe everything laid out for us. And then yeah, I get put, all this exposition. Yeah. And then I, I wanted to put in my notes, I wanted to see if you agree with me or not, but I feel like with this chapter, she's finally recuperating. She comes down the stairs, she's talking, she's cleaned up, you know, mm-hmm. and I feel like she's, she finally has resumed like a position of power, mm. you know, her spirit is renewed. Like I said, she's got, she's well rested. And, and I mean, I know she makes it a good point to talk about how her clothes were clean, like, you know, being uh-huh. out, sleeping outside for a few days. And she just didn't like that, didn't yeah. like that feeling. And so yeah. now she does, you know, she's not, she's not totally independent, but I feel like she's on her way back down that path. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. I think that it's very important that Jane, you know, just, just mentally for herself that she feels that she's in control and that she knows what's going to happen. And even though she's relying on the generosity of strangers, you know, she trusts that they're going to take care of her and that Mm -hmm. she's also, they can trust her that she's not going to take advantage of them because she wants to get a job. She wants to be independent as soon as possible. But it's almost like the, it's almost like the exact moment she arrived at Thornfield. Hmm. You yeah, know, maybe I can see that. to a degree. Other than the fact, other than the fact that she was employed, but yeah, you know, she is she's now not relying on charity. So as uh, in that situation, but yeah, she's still, you know, in in a sense, a little bit lost, I guess, because mm-hmm. she's she's in this new position in this uh, in a new house, and she doesn't know these people, and she's getting to know these people here, and they're getting to know her. She's left the miserable surroundings of sleeping outside mm-hmm. in much the same way that she had left the somewhat miserable surroundings of Lowood. Oh. <laughs> right. And she's, right. Rebir- like I said, that rebirth, you know. Oh, so you're comparing Lowood to her being destitute on the moors. <laughs> I mean, I guess, you know. Oh, yeah. Okay. I can see that. Way. But then what, like I said, but then the difference being between those two, between Thornfield and Morehouse now is that she didn't have Diana and Mary at, at Thornfield. Yeah. Right? She only had Mrs. Fairfax. She had, which was kind of, well, I guess she got Hannah here, but she, now she's got Diana and Mary. Yeah, and Diana and Mary, they have a very, she gets a good sense of of their character, I think, of their being very warm and kind and responsive to her. They want to help her. And I think that's, again, just a great introduction to Diana and Mary, who we're going to we're gonna learn to love in the rest of this book. Yeah, I think we talked about it on the previous chapter, but it's like maybe they can relate to Jane because mm. they're about the same age as her. Yeah. You know, thankfully, it's a stark contrast from Blanche Ingram and the, you know, the mm-hmm. Reed sisters. <laughs> You know, but I thought I thought it was funny that maybe you know it's ironic that they also served as governesses. I was going to say maybe they can relate because they're all governesses. And I'm like, oh wait, they don't know Jane was one. Oh yeah. But I was just thinking, like, was that the only job that women yeah. could get at that time? I it mean, seemed I think like when Jane was at Lowood and she was trying to think about, she wanted to leave and she wanted to find something else and she didn't know what to do. Right? She had such mm-hmm. a long, a hard time trying to decide, and she realized, oh yeah, I could. She said, grant me a new servitude, which is being a governess in a house and it'll be different surroundings. And that's all she wanted. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I guess probably for their, her class, you know, you know, she's middle class or so and, you know, respectable. She doesn't have a lot of options that, you know, she's not going to become a saleswoman. You know, I don't think that's going to be 
part of her and besides she's also educated so like how oh, she, how no. can she use that as a, she has to be a teacher well did they establish it since mentioned that diane and mary have just been back for three weeks like who was living at this house before they came back was it just sinjin and hannah or no i thought they said think, sinjin doesn't even live there i think the father lived there the father lived there with hannah yeah and then sinjin lived elsewhere and diane and mary lived elsewhere yeah the, wow. they were working and living at the house that they worked at i guess okay okay but they seem really comfortable there, even though they're not. Like, it makes, it makes you wonder how often they were visiting their father oh, before well. he died and stuff. And so they just moved right back in oh, and then yeah. living there. Like, maybe, maybe it's a, what was their living situation like as they were governesses? You, know, they were you think they were also eager to leave their, their house, their post? Maybe. And, and they were like, maybe they welcome f- a little, a little uh, respite, a little vacation? Maybe each one of them fell in love with the, with the lord of the manor. <laughs> And then he, he was it revealed that he had a wife in the attic, and they said, "I got to run." Oh, huh. good! I can go back to my dad's house. Ah, oh, okay. Jane well. couldn't do that. Jane doesn't have a dad. <laughs> That's another thing they can have in common, I guess, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we're we're talking a lot about Diane and Mary, but there's a third there's someone, sibling, there's someone else in the house, right? There's Sinjin, and he makes his appearance a couple of times at Jane's bedside, and. We get a little bit of a different sense of him from the way that Jane kind of talks about him and what he says. Mm-hmm. And he seems a little more clinical and a little mean. Or is that is that me projecting? No. Because he makes these sort of unnecessary, I think, unnecessary remarks on Jane's appearance and lack of beauty. Yeah, I, it, it was funny. Like, he seems very, well, like you said, very clinical, very cold, very to the point. Maybe he doesn't have the good people skills, which is... Ironic, you know, or it's, I shouldn't say ironic, I say it's very surprising from a clergyman, or Mm -hmm. is that, you know, is his honesty a virtue? Is that something people come to his past or Mm -hmm. his parish or whatever for? I I would imagine a clergyman, you'd probably want someone who's a little bit warm and inviting and, you know, you could talk your problems with. But he's not going to do any white lies, right? He's going to, he's going to. He's not going to bend he's, the truth. He's going to make them, he might make them feel a little bad. That's why I was thinking he probably, he, he might not be the most successful as a clergyman. <laughs> he's got a very small flock. Yeah. <laughs> they just deal with him because he's the only clergyman around. I guess, yeah. But it, it just, whenever I think of, again, I did not grow up going to church a lot. The few mm-hmm. times I have been as an adult, I always felt, yeah, very warm and welcoming. It would yeah. be weird to think if I would have stayed after the service and had a moment with the with the pastor if he would have made some remarks about my appearance <laughs> you know like what i thought you're supposed to be you know welcome everybody in yeah yeah that's bizarre <laughs> and the funny thing is the sentence not even the worst one at the house when it comes to judging jane right <laughs> i guess hannah's had a little bit of a prior experience with jane that kind of colors how she sees her having met her on the doorstep and having jane kind of asking to come inside mm-hmm. and she doesn't know her and, you know, when Jane finally kind of wakes up and recovers a little bit, she gets dressed, she comes downstairs and Hannah's there kind of making some pies. And, and he, she makes a comment about Jane not being a beggar like she thought she was. And mm-hmm. I, I always thought, oh, that I don't think Hannah says it, but Mr. Rochester said in a previous chapter that it pricks pride where in a previous chapter where Jane and Rochester were talking. They were the first time that they were getting to know each other. Mr. Rochester sees some of Jane's paintings and uh, he asks if maybe a master helped her. And she says, no, indeed. And he says, ah, that pricks pride. Mm. Like Jane is, she's a little, she's, she's dismissive of her looks, but she does think of herself as a lady and takes pride in her accomplishments. Yeah, but I just, I had a hard time when I was reading the first part of that chapter because it seemed like, her, you know, her and Hannah are kind of going back and forth a little bit, and Jane seems to really be holding that grudge. <laughs> like, yeah, like, I think I think for some reason that kind of stuck with me too. Where I, I feel like yeah. I never really noticed it as much, but I, this this time reading it, I'm like, oh, Jane, it's okay. I mean, yeah. she did see you begging, so I don't know why exactly. you're so mad. <laughs> Let it go, Elsa. <laughs> like I don't know. There was a point where it was just like I, I it kind of it, it's very noticeable as mm-hmm. you're reading it, where you're like. Man, I feel like Hannah is trying to be a little bit more apologetic. Yeah. And yeah. Jane's just like, well, why, why were you so mean to me? Right? And it's like, <laughs> they, are, they let you in. You've got some food now. You're all cleaned up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I I think Jane does make a point of saying that it's it's not very Christian of you to mm-hmm. not want to extend some help to me. But then again, you know, it's very hard these days to trust people. People can take advantage of you. Well, so Hannah's true. just taking care of her 
of her kids there. The cynic in them. And I mean, you, you talked about Jane being dismissive of her looks. And I always, I thought that like, it seems like she's always been very critical of her own appearance. But then now it's like, I guess she takes it personal when someone else remarks upon it. Yeah. And you know? I don't know if it's more, if it's not really a commentary on her appearance so much as the fact that, you know, she's, uh, since she's a beggar, if she's begging, then she didn't, she doesn't have the accomplishments or she didn't live her life. In, our, in the right way, I guess. I think that's maybe the connotation of Hannah calling her a beggar, of it yeah. being a judgment on Jane's character, not necessarily her appearance. Yeah, and like I said, I'm sure she's cause she's risen from nothing, and now she doesn't want have anybody call that into question. Right. Right. Kind of reminds me of like if you ever have like a group of friends, and there's always one one friend that you'd make fun of, but then if someone else made fun of them, you're like, hey, 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 you get defensive, <laughs> or it's like, hey, only we can make fun of them. Not not you guys. That's that's our that's our friend that we can, oh, we can pull fun okay. at. <laughs> yeah, that's Jane's. Take it, take it, Wait, wait a minute. I know I'm playing. Oh, <laughs> don't you know? You don't have to. You don't have to twist the knife a little bit. But but Hannah's very chatty. I, I mean, it was it was it was a little tricky. You relate to that. It was a little tricky. Well, I can relate to that, of course. But it was a little tricky trying to read. Like I never. I mean, maybe they do it for a reason, but I feel like it's always very frustrating when I see books, any book, whether it be a classic literature like this or something more common, and you have a character who has like a thick accent, and then the author feels the need to really spell out the dialogue phonetically. Yeah. Like, they could have just said, spoken with a thick accent, they said this. <laughs> Instead, I, I'm literally trying to read it and figure out, okay, what mm-hmm. what is the English translation of this? Yep. Do they say what her language, she's speaking Gaelic or Welsh? What is this thing? <laughs> It's just yeah. the accent, northern accent. Northern think, accent. Yeah. Like, is Hannah, like, do we see Hannah in a lot of the adaptations, really? Not a lot of them. I think the miniseries, some just, of them just the, do show her. But, just the unabridged And miniseries. you get that accent, especially is in it the really? 1973 they... adaptation, my favorite. Okay. They, do, they do a good Hannah. She says, rock down, death's an old car. <laughs> so I, I'm going to be looking for that moment. All right. Okay. You'll, you'll find it. That proves you must have been an honest and faithful servant. I will say that much for you, though you have had the incivility to call me a beggar. Oh, you have none forgive me. There's so many cheats goes about. But do you wish to turn me from the door? And on such a night as you should not have shut out a dog. Oh, it were hard, but I thought more of the children nor myself. They've liked nobody to take care of them but me. I'm like to look sharpish. You want to think too hardly of me. No, but I do. Not so much because you refused me shelter. I might have been an imposter. Just now you made it a species of reproach that I had no brass and no house. Some of the best people that ever lived have been as destitute as I am. And if you're a Christian, you should not consider poverty a crime. No more I ought. Mr. St. John tells me so too. I see I were wrong. Oh, but I've a clear different notion on you now to what I had. <laughs> you look a right down decent little creature. I forgive you now. <laughs> but yeah you you know you get a lot of backstory about the rivers family from hannah after she is trying to protect the family she just spills all the secrets <laughs> yes i'm sure jane only understands half of what she says uh... <laughs> so it's all it's just fine <laughs> but i do find it intriguing that the description that hannah gives on the on the rivers family and their upbringing it reminds me of the bronte siblings mm. and that you know they they like to stay home together uh, they get along well. Um, the, they're, you know, the Brontes and the Rivers, they live simply. They don't have a lot of money, but they are very respectable. And they're probably of good family uh, stock. Mm-hmm. And Sinjin seems to have some flaws, as does Charlotte's brother Branwell. Okay, that's where I got. I got. I have issue with this. Oh, now, yeah. I will say that, you know, now that you mention it, I can totally see the similarities, you know. But I don't, I think it's a stretch to try to compare Sinjin to Branwell. You know, it's one thing to, to compare Dinah and Mary to Emily and Anne because um, we're probably around that same age, very warm and kind and welcoming. Mm. Whereas, you know, Branwell wasn't a clergyman, right? No. No. Branwell, obviously, we know he is very colorful past, right? He had some yes. serious flaws. Mm-hmm. Whereas with Sinjin, I feel like his the flaws we've established at this point might just be he's just very blunt. He yeah. does he does a little rough around the edges. He doesn't know how to how to be how to speak. He's not kind. 
That's well, a flaw, right? I mean, he's he, but he was the one that let her in well, after Hannah think, was trying to keep her out. I so think he's in this kind. chapter, she kind of makes a distinction about it being not really philanthropic, but just kind of out of duty, you know, just because he's a Christian and that's it's, what he's supposed to do. But it's still a kindness, I think, you know, he, <laughs> sure. you know, I feel like there's, there's some to, to you know, if you know the story of Ranwell Bronte, like he had, he was. Not... I mean, he he had some. He was he was ill, basically. You know, yeah. he was he was an alcoholic and he had addictions, but I think that he was a kind person. Like he was mm. probably he. You know, Charlotte loved him very much. The the sisters loved Branwell, so I wouldn't say yeah. that he was. I I wouldn't paint him as totally bad. You know. No, but I just I feel like the more I thought about it, I think. Sinjin is probably like an amalgamation of Branwell and Patrick. Sure, I can you know, see that. Yeah, because Patrick a little was bit more sort of upstanding a, character. Right? If you had to take elements of each one of them, because Sinjin is cl- clearly not as old as Patrick, you mm-hmm. know. But then he's like he, he's their sibling, but then he's not. He's not as. I'm trying to find a good word to describe Branwell. You know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he. <laughs> I mean, for lack of a better word, you could say flawed, right? He's the, he yeah. doesn't. I, I, you, you say Sinjin has flaws, and I don't. They, I feel these are really minor <laughs> compared to some of the transgressions that Branwell has committed when it comes to sleeping with a married woman, right? Right, and like that kind of thing, where it's like Sinjin's a priest, a priest who's just really quiet, who's really, right. who's really bold. Like I said, he's really kind of blunt. But but yeah. then, like I said, I could see Charlotte taking elements of her own father, since she's decided not to have the rivers is father alive in the book. Then she's mm-hmm. going to be using elements of her own father and blending him with the love that she had for her brother without bringing up, you know, his, the flaws that he had in real life. She's not going to try to try to project those onto Sinjin, I guess. I guess if you think of Mr. Rochester as being inspired by a real man in Charlotte Bronte's life, then the other two men in Charlotte Bronte's life, which is her father and her brother, they might get wrapped up in another character, another mm. main male character in this novel. Yeah, because Mr. Reed has deceased. Uh, her mm. uncle is deceased. Like yeah. all these... these. Mr. Old... Brocklehurst is based on a, a real um, principal. Yeah. All of the older family members in these in this book, they're, they're not in the picture anymore. Mm-hmm. They've either passed on or they've departed in mm-hmm. some fashion. And so it's like, well, how can I get my dad into this book? <laughs> oh, well, I'll make a guy a priest. Yeah, and then oh, well, how do I get my brother in the book? Uh, unless John Reed had some had some elements. If the, the young John Reed when he was traveling, oh, and, I hope and, not. No. Well, well, maybe. Yeah, the, the way they describe when the, he was older. When he go when he was older, I feel like he had some Gambling, of the stuff in Branwell. Debts, yeah, yeah, and I think that's what Branwell had too. But yeah, and so now then you get into the whole idea of the comparing like Sinjin with Rochester, and I know that like I still think they've established Sinjin as being very mysterious. I love his introduction in the previous chapter where he just sort of shows up and he just, while she's outside. But then, you know, they've really set him up as being kind of a man of few words. And I did like how he totally gets Jane right. Where, like, mm-hmm. there's a quote where he says, he refers to her as, quote, a young lady who has had a misunderstanding with her friends. And I'm like, <laughs> that's funny. That's exactly what it was. I don't know if it's exactly. It's not really a misunderstanding. And a it's very, pretty clear and what... A, in why a, she had to in leave. a very vague way of saying it <laughs> she had a disagreement with some people that she was living with because I, I i reread it again just before we started and i think there was a reference to like where they say oh i'll put i'll send you on your way as soon as you can tell me who to put you in touch with and she's like well i don't have any family or or, mm-hmm. or friends and it's like well you kind of do have some friends you just don't want mm. to be with them and so this is sinjin basically saying like okay I know you got friends. Everyone's going to have some kind of friends. I mean, I mean maybe before you got to, because even when she got to Lowood, she made friends. So it's like, no, granted, yeah. some of them didn't survive. But, <laughs> but I don't like, know how, how, you know, how close are, did she get with them? Did they keep in touch? Like when she went away to Thornfield, no. you don't really get a sense that she's writing letters to them and saying, hey, how are you doing? Who knows? But I, I mean, just met this awesome guy. <laughs> well, yeah. And I feel like, you know, the, the Rivers family, they're, it's, they can kind of treat her like a foster child where it's like, okay, as soon as we figure out a better oh, home for you. Yeah. You know, I guess you could put her back in touch with the, with the, uh, Reed sisters in yeah. a way they're a sort of family or, you know, if she wanted to, you know, you can go back. Maybe Mrs. Fairfax knew some has a, has a, a relative somewhere that she could <laughs> stay with, 
But yeah, that's what I'm saying. So like, but like Sinjin totally calls it. Yeah, like she's she's not here because she's some total orphan wandering. That like it's they, they could tell because like I said because she was her clothing was not completely torn up and, and ratty, right? It was just dirty because she'd been sleeping yeah, outside. They knew that she had some education. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, you know, Sinjin is presented, I think, very in this chapter already as being a, just an immediate contrast to Rochester. I guess as you're saying, he's observant. Like Rochester is, he does mm-hmm. observe Jane and, and watches her. But you know, Sinjin is very handsome and severe, which is a contrast to Rochester, who is perhaps not so handsome, but who's uh, also he likes to talk and he he's very uh, friendly, mm-hmm. or I should say, at a, at a later point he gets more friendly. But Sinjin is he he's he's he seems to have a wall up, you know. Do they think? But but, they, but you think they presented Sinjin as being more handsome than Rochester? Oh yeah. Okay. But I think maybe I'm just maybe I'm just sort of the the adaptations are kind of coloring my view because <laughs> I feel like most of the adaptations Sinjin is not well the ones that he's actually in. I um, mean, do you remember a famous quote for Jane when uh, Rochester says, "Do you think me handsome?" and Jane says, "No." <laughs> well, yeah, but it's just like I feel like the adaptations don't make Sinjin as this this strikingly ruggedly oh, good-looking man. I mean, right? the way that Charlotte or Jane describes Sinjin, it seems pretty impossible. He's like a Greek god. He's oh, like is, Apollo. <laughs> uh, is it? Or is that, okay. I, 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 I read past that part. I mean, but. if that's if that's in this chapter, which I believe it is, it might be in the next chapter. But uh, that's yeah. funny. Man, then apparently the casting directors did not. Pay <laughs> they attention. get the memo. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess we'll we'll watch the adaptations again. I mean, I, I can I can picture Jamie Bell in in the 2011 yeah, adaptation. Jamie Bell's okay. Yeah, and then I think of who's in the in the 1973. It was this blonde kind of pale, yeah. stringy blonde guy, right? <laughs> like I didn't think of him as you know. Yeah. I keep we, we talk about this all the time in this podcast where. A lot of the, as I'm rereading it, I keep picturing the 73 mm-hmm. adaptation. So as I'm seeing Sinjin, I'm just like, this is, nope. this is the Greek god, huh? This is the, <laughs> this is the Apollo, I guess. Oh, well, that's another thing. When we go back through the adaptations, who's the most uh, accurate, like physically accurate Sinjin? Well, again, and I, I mean, Sinjin's missing from a lot of the adaptations, unfortunately. That's right? true. Yeah, so you don't so. have a lot of options. <laughs> but then at least, so, so then how do we, okay, in order to wrap up this chapter, I feel like the last big thing we get is... Jane kind of going through her backstory, right? But she doesn't want to tell too much of it. Right, yeah. So she, I, mean, I feel like she tells a little bit more than she needs to, but I guess she wants to show that she's trustworthy. Yeah, is that something you would do, right? Like, I feel like there's like a fine line to walk without, you know, you don't want to reveal too much, but then you also want to give these people some information because they've been so gracious yeah. to take you in, yeah. you know, especially if you want to try to shed that beggar image that Hannah assigned <laughs> to her, Yeah. you know, but then it's like, I also don't want to be found out yeah, but and Jane. I think Jane gives enough information to show that she's educated. You know, and she didn't. She didn't make a. She just made a, a small error of judgment that led her astray. But uh, she's, you know, she's a she's a hard worker and she's mm-hmm. she's respectable. Yeah, I and mean, I think that's the one thing you can kind of carry on into the next chapter. And the next chapter is just like, like how long can she keep this secret? Oh yeah, right. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how uh, they. How if they find out how they find out who she really is? What manner is it? A, is it going to be a good thing or a bad thing if they find out? Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. But Jane has to keep assuming this fake name, Jane Elliot, much like our author Charlotte Bronte also assumed a fake name. So there's a lot of fake names going around. Is there any interesting <laughs> context about the use of a pseudonym or an alter ego to sort of not reveal yourself? Well, I wonder if you find this interesting of like, okay, if you're if you're going to write a book and you don't want anyone to know it's you, like what, how do you pick the name? How do you pick your name? Mm-hmm. And we're not entirely sure of how Charlotte Bronte picked her pen name, which she, she picked it with her sisters. So they, they're all, they all use the same initials um, and they use the last name of Bell instead of Bronte. And Jamie Bell from the adaptation, yes, of course. They were big fans of Jamie Bell, apparently. Yeah. And then um, Charlotte took on the name Currer, and Emily took on the name Ellis, and Anne took on the name Acton. And mm. they were all sort of masculine-sounding names. And Charlotte wrote about her sister's choice to write under pseudonyms when she wrote the biographical notice for the 1850 editions of Wuthering Heights and Agnes Grey. That's after Emily and Anne had passed away. And Charlotte Bronte had said their ambiguous choice was, quote, dictated by a sort of conscientious scruple at assuming Christian names, positively masculine, 
while we did not like to declare ourselves women because we had a vague impression that authoresses are liable to be looked on with prejudice. So that, hmm. you know, Charlotte, Charlotte also, you know, she feared that the people she knew might recognize her work. So she said in a letter, she also said in a letter once that, quote, it would fetter me intolerably to ever be conscious in writing that my book must be read by ordinary acquaintances. So yeah, you know, she doesn't really say why she picked these names, like these exact names, but mm -hmm. it is thought that the sisters picked last name Bell because of the arrival at the time of their father's new curate, Arthur Bell Nichols, and this is the man Charlotte Bronte would later marry. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it seems I read in I read in a book that it seems more likely they chose it because of a man they admired named Dr. Andrew Bell, who founded the Madras system of education which i've never heard of before i've never heard of, the madras, never heard of yeah. dr andrew <laughs> but mm -hmm. apparently the madras system is where a teacher instructs older students and then those students will teach the younger students mm -hmm. i guess save time <laughs> uh so yeah and then with the first name kerr charlotte may have picked the name kerr because of a well-known benevolent lady in yorkshire named francis mary richardson kerr who is thought to have assisted patrick bronte when he was recently widowed yeah yeah. See, working in people in her life into the story. Yeah. Well, into the, at least, or at least using the name in some capacity, right? And she gets inspired that... by these names, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and if I want to come full circle with like a six degrees thing, I will point out Jamie Bell, mm -hmm. who starred as Sinjin in the 2011 adaptation, mm -hmm. last name Bell. What was his most famous role in, in his movie career? Billy Elliot. Billy Elliot. <laughs> Elliot and Bell. Ah. It all comes together. Oh, my God. He was made to be Sinjin. <laughs> <laughs> the Greek god that he was, yes. <laughs> well, we're getting close to wrapping up here. So as we do with all of our episodes, we'll end with a meaningful passage or quote from the chapter that meant a lot to us. Charlene, it's your turn to go first. What was your most meaningful passage or quote from chapter 29? Well, it was difficult to find a quote in this one because it was just a lot of observances. But this particular observance I enjoyed, so I will read uh, what Jane says about Diana and Mary. She said, quote, Diana had a voice toned to my ear like the cooing of a dove. She possessed eyes whose gaze I delighted to encounter. Her whole face seemed to me full of charm. Mary's countenance was equally intelligent, her features equally pretty, but her expression was more reserved and her manners, though gentle, more distant. Diana looked and spoke with a certain authority. She had a will, evidently. So hmm. I just... You know, you don't get too many positive female characters in Jane's life, adult life. Okay. Um, you know, last one really is Helen. Helen, yeah, yeah. Best character in the book. <laughs> well, maybe this will supplant the Helen? No? Yes? No? That's a hard one. That's a hard one. <laughs> but, you know, you just, you know, you get a sense that you know, I'd like to be friends with them. They seem like really cool people. <laughs> so that's what it was. You just like the description enough to kind yeah, of... Yeah, succinct and it's clear. You get a good sense of their character. Yeah, and it makes you, it makes you feel like... We, we mentioned a minute ago about how, like, the mystery now is, is she going to be found out oh, while she's sure. there? And you start, I'm starting to wonder if, is she going to slip up and let it, and tell them if she starts really relating to them? Oh, yeah. Now Trusting that she finally them? has, I mean, granted, she had Helen back at Lowood, but she hasn't really had that, that, that gal pal kind of girlfriend mm -hmm. of her own age as an adult, right? So it's like, I can yeah. see her easily just being like... If something were to come in conversation with a man in her life where she might be just like, oh, you know, <laughs> you don't want to talk about it, but they'll get it out of her. Well, let, let, let's uh, set this up in this in this episode uh, going forward in this chapter, in the subsequent chapters. Mike, t just keep in mind while you're reading. Is there a point if you were Jane that you would tell them your story? Okay. If you would tell them the truth? Sure. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> I think we all have moments like that in our life where there's something going on and you're like, when should I tell this person? Mm -hmm. Is the right time to tell them? Yeah. And this is different, like, you know, because I think she's trying to enjoy this moment mm -hmm. with these with these nice people and she's recovering and she's being well fed and taken care of and, and bathing and clean clothes and all this <laughs> stuff. And now it's like, but I don't want them to know what's going on. Because maybe they'll turn me in. Or something, <laughs> you know, or because it's like, as we've seen in this book, there seems to not be that big of a universe the Jane oh, yeah. Eyre cinematic universe here where it's like <laughs> that people know somebody who knows somebody where mm -hmm. it's like, Oh, you know, the guy who showed up at, uh, was it, uh, uh, birth, Mr. Mason knew that one guy who was, oh, got yeah. the, you know, it's like, they're all kind of connected and all it's going to take is wait a minute. 
I know, I know, I know that guy. I think he once told, but there was a there was oh. a guy named Edward Fairfax Rochester. Well, that's that, true. You know, so that's yeah. So that's the tricky part. She can't reveal too much. Yeah, that's true. While also enjoying her time. Yeah. So, Mike, what is your meaningful passage or quote? I ha- I also had a tough time mm-hmm. kind of going with one, and so I chose one at the beginning because it kind of reminded me of another quote mm. from a, a famous person who wrote under a pseudonym. Mm-hmm. Um, and the quote comes from the the moment when. Jane and Hannah are kind of having their their conversation, and Jane is starting to understand like like now I I know I know why Hannah was so mean to me at first mm-hmm. um, when she wouldn't let me in, and so Jane says, "quote Prejudices it is well known are most difficult to eradicate from the heart whose soil has never been loosened or fertilized by education. They grow there, firm as weeds among stones." Yeah, And so I kept talking earlier about how, like, why is she holding this grudge? And it's like, well, maybe she's feeling like, you know, if only Hannah had been more educated or had, or had, um, well, as I was going to mention. Wasn't as prejudiced. Yeah. You know, and it kind of reminded me a lot of a quote by Mark Twain, a.k.a. Samuel Clemens, again, wrote under a pseudonym, right? (laughs) And where did the name come from? It was the... When you put the when you depth, the in, depth the in the water, right? Yeah. They call it Mark Twain, right? You say, where did these pseudonyms come from? Uh, a couple of years back, Charlene and I went to the Mark Twain Museum in Hartford, Connecticut, which was really, really fun. Mm-hmm. I, I, I did enjoy my time there. And there's a very famous quote from, from Mark Twain, which we made it a point to buy a refrigerator magnet that had that quote on it. And the quote is, travel is fatal to prejudice. Mm-hmm. Um, the, there's, a, it's a, there's a full-length quote, which, I mean, I can kind of read it here. It, the, the entire quote is, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. And then, you know, and it kind of goes on. But, like, this, this notion that, that if you've lived a life and seen the world, it's, it's, you, your prejudices kind of go away. And I mm-hmm. feel like maybe Hannah has not. Yeah, for sure. You know. And, so and they're just, firm as weeds among stones. Yeah, yeah. And so I thought that was interesting because it's also, it, it kind of, like I said, as soon as I was reading it, I thought, it's like the Mark Twain quote Mm -hmm. so much. And so that kind of reminded me of a pleasant memory that I had in my life as well. And so that's why (laughs) this, that quote meant so much to me. Oh yeah. I feel like Jane, it's funny to have Jane of all people saying that because she, she's actually seen a lot for a 19 year old, right? Like she's had a lot of experiences. Yeah. Had her heart broken. Even though, like I said, and she's gone through all the the pain and and suffering and loss from Mm -hmm. Lowood and she's dealt with rude relatives and she you know and it's like and yet she's only like i said she's only been a few places doesn't have a lot of family but yet she's lived a pretty hard life and 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 i think it's made her more open which is kind of funny her prejudices have kind of peeled away right well she's gotten more educated and had more experiences like you said exactly thank you so much for listening if you enjoyed our podcast please subscribe and leave us a review on your preferred podcast platform this really helps us grow and reach new listeners if you want to talk Jane Eyre with me online, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at AirGuide. That's E-Y-R-E. And if you want to hear more from me, I host my own podcast called Out of Touchstone, where my good friend Chad and I discuss all the films that Disney produced for their Touchstone Pictures label. You can also find me on Twitter at Mike DeKalb. Thank you, and farewell for the present. Thank you.